going to do something of a lightning quick presentation to try to get to a lot of data, and I hope to not lose you. But uh, I decided to go this route and not talk about everything on every slide. But um, we can start with behavioral modernity. Ron talks about behavioral modernity as an outdated concept. I would 100% agree with this. It's highly problematic in light of the current evidence. Uh, John Shea, paleoanthropologist, says, it has no further value in human origins research. So any theological anthropology that talks about behavioral modernity is passe. I would suggest that you avoid it, as Ron wisely does. We can talk about out of Africa. I think uh, there's a danger, and I'm going to ask Ron about this, where it is, of connecting behavioral modernity with out of Africa, but they're not the same thing. So out of Africa is larger than behavioral modernity. The behavioral revolution or upper Paleolithic revolution of 40,000 years ago or so is not the same as out of Africa. This is an idea that uh, consensus as far as 2015, even 2016, out of Africa is still the consensus view. And uh, it changes. It's been changing for decades. Uh, it shows up in the 90s with work at folks at uh, UC Berkeley, Wilson and Kim's lab. This is this view, and I would say it is still the predominant view as opposed to something like multi-regionalism. And so it's still the consensus. It's a little bit more messy these days. We have interbreeding. We have divergence. We have convergence. We have all kinds of interesting things going on with various hominid populations, which Ron describes well, but the human species, as far as we all exist today, is still coming out of Africa. The question is, how are they coming out, out of Africa? When? Where? And uh, we can say, what's the role of these other hominins? There's forensic reconstructions of three of them, two Neanderthals, and one that's called the hobbits, Homo floresiensis, in Indonesia. And we can think about life for Homo sapiens, whatever they were, 100,000 years ago. We have other groups around, including two that show up with the genetic evidence that we don't have fossil remains of. And uh, we can say, well, what does that mean? They're occasionally mating, and perhaps this should be our paradigm for interpreting the fossil evidence. The Lord of the Rings. Mark Thomas has gone there. Paleoanthropologist says it looks more like a Lord of the Rings type of world with many hominid populations. So we think about, well, what would this look like? Right? What are these interactions? This is the language, this is the realm of fantasy, perhaps. Um, Rather than science, but science has got us there. I think Tolkien would be happy. He says, he didn't invent it, he discovered it. Maybe he's on to something. What about the unity of humanity? What does this mean? Are we one family or many? The question of the one and the many. Well, um, think about our own families. Are we one and many? Think about uh, today. All right, think about um, what does it mean to be one? What does it mean to be many? This is a very interesting question that has long occupied many theologians. But we can look at some waypoints, some landmarks in this, some foundations. We can still say that our mitochondrial DNA and our Y chromosomal DNA is 100% African, Homo sapien, as far as the DNA and the species are defined genetically, which is not a clear, straightforward sort of thing. Um, we have no Neanderthal Y chromosome DNA in humans, no Neanderthal MT DNA, mitochondrial DNA in humans, but uh, something that looks a lot like human mitochondrial DNA, as Ron points out, eventually replaced my mitochondrial DNA and Neanderthals. So you have a sense of other hominids being grafted onto the human lineage. And I have sort of won this through intermixing, through interbreeding. What does this look like? Right? The average Neanderthal woman was much stronger than the average Homo sapien man. And so we think about, okay, well, what were these relationships? What were their, what they consist of? But to mess things up more, a while back we thought uh, everyone's Y chromosome, Y chromosomes, every man's Y chromosome, went back to a group that lived about 200,000 years ago, but then in 2013, Albert Perry and 11 men in Cameroon had a more ancient Y chromosome, pushing us back to 338,000 years ago. At the time, folks said, this is impossible because it's older than the human species. We can't have to know ourselves older than the human species. But uh, recent evidence in Morocco helps us out with that, which we'll talk about in a moment. Well, now we have fossil evidence that substantiates the story. Still in Africa, 
What about other hominids? Well, we can talk about where Neanderthals fit into this picture. Did we learn anything from Neanderthals? I would say there is evidence. We learned some significant stuff from Neanderthals. They had uh, working of leather before us, <coughs> burnishes or lissors are found among the Neanderthals before Homo sapiens, and it seems that uh, we learned these. Maybe it's independent, but uh, someone argued we learned it. Cave art, we talked about cave art, symbolic ornaments. Uh, even before the recent data, a couple months ago, or a couple weeks ago, um, there was already work talking about the, taint, the painting of cave art. Um, there was new painting te or dating techniques in the other paintings that pushed, pushed some of the paintings back before humans were there. Denisovan bracelets, quite ornate <coughs> bracelets. So we have art, we have all kinds of interesting things going on. And my favorite, just to give you a few examples, is the use of medicinal plants by Neanderthals, which we get from uh, studying their teeth. We know they used aspirin, we know they used uh, poplar, and even penicillin, wow. which they self-medicated for intestinal parasites. Without wow. going too much of that, these are not uh, boorish creatures who are <laughs> unintelligent, to say the least. So we can talk about the Morocco finds. We have uh, some finds that push humanity back, Homo sapiens, possibly back to 350,000 years ago. But ambiguity, are these really human fossils? What do we mean by human? Well, it's sort of a rule of thumb sort of thing according to pale paleogenomics. We can say, OK, well, how close is close enough? But well, we don't have DNA for these examples, and there's debate. Jeffrey Schwartz at University of Pittsburgh says not Homo sapiens. Um, Mariana Martian Torres at uh, London University City College of London says uh, not Homo sapiens, but Chris Stringer, who's also British, says they are. And so the people who publish these results. So we say, well, they're maybe close enough. If you look at the skulls, if you know what uh, Neanderthal skulls versus classic Homo sapiens skulls, I say, huh? The elongated football shape looks more like Neanderthals and humans. But uh, this has to do with arguments in paleobiology. Under determination of data, who decides? When there's multiple ways to interpret the data, well, often faith comes in at that point. But what it shows us, if nothing else, is there was no morphological Big Bang. It's continuous. It's gradual. This is exactly what Darwin said it would look like a long time ago. And there's no behavioral revolution. There's no morphological revolution. So it gets more complicated. We can take individuals like the Khoisan and say, OK, these are our most indigenous African peoples. But some recent data shows that up to 50% of their DNA is Eurasian because people went back to Africa to even confuse the picture more. So we have the most indigenous Africans are half Eurasian. Right? <laughs> coming from Sardinia, coming from the Basque, which were the cro -Magnons. So the picture gets more and more complex, but um, ancient humans and hominids tend to like each other, at least as far as breeding is an indication of liking. So we can say, uh, what's going on here? But what about hominids? Okay, we're going to talk about hominids. Are hominids unique? We can push the envelope a bit more. What do we mean by uniqueness? Does this mean we're special? Does this mean we're of more value? Does this mean that um, we're better than other animals? Is this based on behaviors? Is this based on characteristics? Which characteristics? Does this have something to do with our brains? Does this have something to do with our art? We're using these capacities to define us. Can we really do that legitimately in a way that makes any sense scientifically? I think it's difficult. We can talk about our brains. Gerhard Roth, German neuroscientist, says in terms of overall structure, our brains are not unique. They're not very different than the brains of other mammals or vertebrates mm -hmm. in terms of uh, overall size, relative size, major parts, general organization. He gives some examples. Do we have the largest brain? No. Elephants have the largest brain in actual size, or actually whales. So elephants and whales are larger than humans. What about relative to body size? Our brain is 2% of our body mass. So is the dolphin brain. But rodents beat us there. Right. Um, elephants, dolphins, whales have the largest brain they can for their body size, and there's supposed to be an image there that doesn't appear. Oh well. Um, largest cerebral cortex. Do we have the largest cerebral cortex? The answer is no, we don't. And elephants have at least main cortical neurons as humans. Cetaceans, whales, as well as elephants, have prefrontal cortices, which are much larger in absolute terms 
than the human prefrontal cortex, but what they do with this massive highest brain center remains a mystery so far. We can't get inside of a whale's brain to know what they're thinking. Are they thinking about God? Perhaps they have systematic theologies. <laughs> the answer is we just don't know, so there's mystery. What about speech centers? Speech centers uh, is another big question mark. There's evidence for speech centers in other animals, and um, we can talk about that. What about mirror neurons? Some people say mirror neurons is the golden grail, the holy grail that makes humans unique. And uh, what's strange is they're originally found in monkeys, so I don't know how that works. But uh, we also have evidence for them in birds, in dogs, and many people question whether humans really have mirror neurons. So uh, to say that's what makes us unique, that's something very debatable in neuroscience. I would not want to go there. Culture. Lots of evidence for culture in animals, no matter how you define it, whether material, whether verbal, tools and technology, tool construction in apes, saving tools for later use. Dolphins have recently started using conch cells to eat fish, and uh, pretty interesting stuff off the coast of Australia. Tool types by New Caledonian crows. Let's get out of the mammals into the birds. We find that they are producing tools that are more elaborate, more sophisticated than what our own Lydians was producing two million years ago in terms of hooks and probes and other things. So uh, tool use, not unique to hominins. Self-awareness, not unique to hominins. You can look at the mirror. Self-recognition data, also in the birds, not even unique to mammals. Language, we've long assumed that we've had language without evidence to support it. And the evidence has not really substantiated language and hominins alone. We talk about chimpanzees, but I find more interesting is great parrots and our beloved dogs. We have dogs like Rico, who can get you one of 200 different objects when you ask them, can learn a new word, remember it months later, according to Science Magazine. Chaser knows over a thousand words. Wow. Right. These are very large vocabularies. Alex the Great Parrot, you can watch videos of him talking in meaningful use of English lexicons to Irene Pepperberg, who is a scientist who studied that. Right. And he asked, well, what color am I? <laughs> and she said, yes, you're gray, Alex. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's going on with these animals? Metacognition. Thoughts about thoughts about thoughts. My thoughts about your thoughts about my thoughts about your thoughts. As best as we can tell, there are a number of animals that have these. Birds as well as primates. We're very primatocentric when we talk about animals, but uh, the birds are just as significant, especially the corvids. Morality. Lots of arguments for morality in animals. Yes. What about immorality? That's not one a lot of people like to talk about, but if they have morality and they have moral norms, then uh, when you have pleasure killing, when you have uh, genocide and chimpanzees, when you have dolphins yes. doing some nasty things that they seem to be fully aware they're doing, I think you have a good argument for immorality in animals. Do they need revenge? Do they need redemption? What about sin? How far back does it go? If we think about the Genesis account, the first animal, if you're reading it as a Jew, which I like to read in the Old Testament, Christian Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, as a Jewish text, it's an animal that was created earlier that is doing the sinning, right? Sin goes back in the book of Genesis, deeper than humans, and uh, maybe we can't see this if we're already using traditional eyes coming through our various theological traditions. I like to go back to Jewish eyes when I read Jewish texts. But we can say, okay, well, what is Jewish text? What, Jew, what did Jewish eyes say about the image of God? My argument for over a decade now, it's hard to believe, has been to see the image of God as election. That God is choosing or electing a people, a lineage, always a lineage in the Jewish idea. Lineages are important. Genealogies, toilet built, are important to fulfill God's purposes. You see this everywhere. We can look at Abraham through Sarah and Hagar. Right? Lineages involve both men and women, always. You can't have a lineage without cooperation of men and women. Lineage of Jacob, Israel, with Rachel, Leah, Bilma, and Zilpah, a nation of priests, right? One lineage is called as a blessing, another lineage is called as a nation of priests. 
Another lineage is called specifically as priests of the temple. Another lineage is called as kings. We have lineages called to a purpose, particular purposes, to be blessing to those outside that circle. And we can say, well, this isn't about individual salvation. Sorry, Calvinists in the room, or Augustinians. Jewish understandings of election are nothing to do with individual salvation. It's responsibility, it's accountability to others and to God. And we find when we look at Genesis, with the image and likeness of God, we find all the structural elements of the Imago Dei. Things like divine blessing, multiplication of progeny, which is also development of progeny. It's a very evolutionary word that's used there. Giving of commandments and the promise of the land. This is all going on. We find that this election is for a special purpose within the context of God's wired plan. Not about privilege, not about salvation, rather about obedience and service. We find concentric circles of election in the days. The days are concentric circles. Like Jay said, we don't get our own day as humans. We're a day six animal. And we're chosen from among the day six animals to be priests to go back to represent God hmm. to the day six animals, right? Maybe mammals are the basic animals. But they're not the only ones who have a relationship with God. All the creatures have a relationship with God. And we play a role in that as one among many of the basic animals. Adam and Eve thus are prototypes of Abraham and Sarah. Whether they were literal people or not, um, this structure is the structure we're given. In the text, the lineage of Abraham through Sarah is elected to be a nation of distant priests. In light of other nations, Adam and Eve are prototypes and archetypes are chosen, selected, called to be a species of priests to other hominids and non hominid species. And we say, well, who were Adam and Eve? I would suggest we try to be a little bit more literalistic than these so called biblical literalists when we think about this. We can look at some folks like John Walton who says, well, if you look at the text, there are other people outside of Eden, outside of Adam and Eve. That's not the only textual option, so maybe it looks more like this. Gerald Collins, to pick on a Catholic, says the same thing. The Genesis narrative seems to allow for others existing elsewhere, off stage and outside of Eden, yeah. Eden right? Yeah. Well, Collins is a Roman Catholic priest, very orthodox. John Walton is a Old Testament scholar at Wheaton, right? So um, they're saying, wait, there's people out there besides Adam and Eve. So we say, well, who are these people? What are they doing? Cain's afraid of them. When Cain is exiled, yeah. because he's not serving God, as humans would call to serve God. So he goes out to the garden. God says, I'll protect you. But he's afraid. Who's he afraid of? Other people. People living outside of Eden. We must conclude then that there's other people. But I think most significant for this understanding, for this context, is that Cain interbreeds with other people outside of Eden. The classic question of Cain's life, wife, we can turn it around and say, wait, Cain's wife is not a descendant of Adam and Eve. What's going on here? We read that Cain and his wife leave numerous descendants. Non-descendants of Adam and Eve in the Bible itself in a very literalistic interpretation. This means that even in Genesis, not all human beings who have ever existed can trace their entire pedigree exclusively to Adam and Eve. We have a human mosaic right there in the earlier chapters of Genesis itself, which does not look very different from what we're seeing in larger terms if we think about, okay, what's the implications? What does it mean to be grafted into the family of Adam and Eve? As Neanderthals were grafted into the human family through our intermixing. What's the theological significance of that, of that marriage? This is a similar story that we find in paleoanthropology and paleogenomics. Right? We say, okay, well, what's the role of incarnation? Jesus is, you might call him Christ, you might call him Messiah, but what does that mean? He's the anointed one, he's the elect one. Jesus is the elect one. The incarnation is also about the election. Right, so the circles expand and close up in Jesus. Right, and We have this expansion and closing, this converging, and this diversification. And um, what does Jesus say about the kingdom of God? Oh, it's like a mustard seed. A tiny little seed with a very small beginning. But 
expands. And the branches become um, a haven for the birds, which represent the nations, the ethnicities of the world. Right? So growth metaphors are predominant. Right? I think these are very similar stories. There's lots of ways to think about this question. But um, I would say election is still the most useful category as far as I can see understanding this. And uh, I think my primary question to Ron is, uh, what do you think about election? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I really appreciate, Joshua, your uh, a careful attention to uh, the, the scientific literature. That's always characterized your work, and you really uh, keep up with it in the way that very few uh, people in systematic theology attempt to. I mean, d detailed attention to journal articles, right? Uh, very important uh, key feature to his work and to its success in this field, I think. Uh, yeah, so let me get to the question of election maybe this way. I, I want to point out a difference, difference in meaning between the way, Joshua, I think you are using the word lineage and the way I was using the word lineage. I think it's very important. That, uh, I, I, challenge me if you don't think I'm right, but I think, I think there's a different uh, use of the word here. Uh, particular, I mean, it came clear to me uh, when you finally got to begin to talk about uh, Adam and Eve and you know, your, your interpretation of Genesis uh, 1, 2, 3, etc. Uh, but right at the very beginning, you, you use this phrase, other humans grafted into the, no, other hominins grafted into the human lineage. I would not put it that way. All hominins, by definition, are in the human lineage. Some may be dead ends, some may be disappear without remainder, but um, all are in. The question is whether they interbreed and leave descendants who remain in even to this day. Uh, or right at the end, you used another phrase. It was the same, essentially the same thing. Um, how did you put it? Neanderthals are grafted into the human family. No. Neanderthals are part of the hominin lineage. They are part of the human family. Interbreeding does not make them part of the hominin lineage. Interbreeding is proof that they are already in the hominin lineage. And interbreeding is what keeps their DNA active in the hominin lineage, even though they, as a tribe, have disappeared. Uh, but they, you don't come into the hominin lineage. And as you sketched it out, this sketch right here is, is well, there was an earlier version that, would, that might have represented this better. Um, it, it seemed to suggest that the hominin lineage is a kind of a narrow thing. Um, Tra so trace human, human, human non-humans into the human language. So non-human hominids. Well, I, 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 that language I'm not wanting to use. Yeah. So that's maybe the maybe that's the key difference, and maybe we ought to bat that around a little bit. I want to use the language of hominin lineage, where I think you want to use the distinct langu language of distinct human. Mm -hmm. And I, I I I don't think that works. I don't think it uh, has clear definition or coherence anymore. Um, yeah, so it, it, I think it's a point worth exploring. <coughs> but but, but um, as you presented some of the lineages from Hebrew scripture uh, in that part of the talk where you were beginning to talk about that, I, I, I sensed the same thing at play. And here's where I want to get to something that is really very delicate. I want to preface it by saying uh, Jews and Christians um, have very different commitments on certain things. For our Jewish sisters and brothers, uh, all this talk about incarnation is utterly scandalous, deeply offensive. Conversely, for a Gentile Christian, the talk about a chosen people, elect, is deeply scandalous, offensive. How can there be a chosen people? 
Um, so, I'm, with the painful history of that mutual scandal and the way in which it has borne horrific consequences, I, I want to engage you on this question of lineage, but with the difference that I've already noted in mind. All right? So how do I want to put this? Um, God creates humanity from this entire breadth of diversity that I want to call the human lineage, not, not a narrow strand, but the entire breadth of the diversity that, that I want to call the human lineage. In creating that humanity, God prepares creation for the incarnation. What I don't like about election is really, I think, a couple of things, some of which is, have already been touched on, and I've sort of pushed back and held to a more traditional view. Some of you wanted to push me in the direction of a more, uh, what, a more generous uh, scope, of gr a greater breadth of incarnation. And I wanted to say, well, no, I'm not sure that's right. But um, it seems to me if you take the, the notion of election and narrow it down to the human species, or human in the way that you want to use it, as opposed to hominin lineage, you, you've made that problem even worse. You've made the election the foundation of exclusivity and uh, made that exclusivity, in my view, uh, needlessly and exceedingly narrow. Mindful that there are many in the room who want me to broaden my definition of, of uh, incarnation more broadly. I think you're, you're, you're moving in a more narrow direction. The other, the other thing, though, is is um, goes deep down into kind of my formation as a, as a Protestant theologian over the last few decades. It's probably true in various ways of others in the room who also have been formed in Protestant ways of thinking. Uh, there is this tendency to embrace the doctrine of election as a, as a way of understanding uh, uh, incarnation and as a way of saying that it is utterly by grace, by God's sovereign choice, by, uh, I mean, I, you know, I grew up singing the hymns, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. You know, it, it, it's not by works of righteousness and not by any accomplishments and it's not even by anything that God has already accomplished as creator in preparing human beings, but sheer, grat uh, sheer gratuitousness on God's part, saying, well, I could choose any creature out here. I, could, uh, I mean, you, you, you mentioned a number of closely competitive creatures, like, like dolphins. Uh, why not broaden that out even further? Uh, God, could God not choose just any creature? and say, I will become incarnate in this form and have it do the same kind of work in, in theology. I don't think that that's possible because I think uh, I, I want to hold together more closely than I sense that you, you, you want to, uh, creation and incarnation. I want to hold the two together so that incarnation is not an arbitrary act of election, but rather one that corresponds very... Um, what uh, very appropriately corresponds to the work of God in preparing uh, the creation to receive the incarnation. Where has God done that? I want to argue that that's in the human, uh, the hominin lineage, uh, the, the, the totality of that hominin lineage. So, um, so the differences are very interesting. And I think all the more interesting because of the, the rigor with which you have come at this and with, with which you have... Uh, not only read this, this material is you know, relatively unimportant, but really, really engage the scientific literature. It's, it's obvious that you have struggled with this and wrestled and thought very, very deep. And um, if anything, it, it's like um, two uh, people coming from a similar source and diverging, and now maybe we can learn from, some, uh, from each other and uh, grow as a result of a little bit of integration of ideas. So I, I, I welcome that. All right? All right. So we're going to be